Welcome to Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert, a podcast sponsored by the Healing Lives Center. Discover how to love and lead your family well and biblically. God created sex, marriage, and the family for our stewardship, growth, and benefit. My heart and passion is to teach, train, educate, and disciple Christians that want strong marriages and families. The Healing Lives Center has been serving Christians since the year 2000. Its mission is to be a center for sex, trauma, and marriage education and transformation, where we offer counseling, coaching, courses, and speaking services to you, your church, or ministry. Check us out at HealingLives.com. Welcome, welcome. Today I have an amazing uh, chance to have a very difficult and important conversation about a hard topic. Um, So I'm really excited today to to talk to you, Daryl Rogers. Um, So welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on today. Yes, um, we, I don't know, it's one of these, there's so many topics, it's just not fun to talk about. And then today, mm-hmm. we're definitely going to get into some very personal story and um, just kind of what's led to to you doing what you do today and what your heart and passion is. So share us a little bit about um, just kind of that overview of your story and what God's done in your life. Okay. So um, in 2014, my oldest son, Chase, died in a drug impaired wreck. Um, and I had no experience with addiction in my family. Mm-hmm. Um, it never really been uh, exposed to any of that at all. And so it caught me completely off guard because uh, Chase um, really was in his soft, uh, well, I mean, his uh, freshman year of college, the, the right. second semester of his freshman year that um, he dropped out of college. That, that's when I really knew he had a problem, gotcha. uh, um, a, a substance abuse problem. And um, uh, it just kind of spiraled out of control from there. And then, um, you know, uh, that was about a year and a half before he died in the wreck. Okay. Um, and then when he when he passed away, um, it just really um, I was looking for answers. I was trying to find out what is this all about? You know, yeah. what? And, and I went on a search to try to get some answers about addiction. And um, part of that was, um, you know, as I was learning, I was beginning to do uh, substance abuse prevention speaking, impaired driving prevention mm-hmm. speaking. And then um, uh, someone directed me to PAL, which is a, um, a faith-based, a Christian-based group that's mm-hmm. nonprofit that is, um, stands for, PAL stands for Parents of Addicted Loved Ones. Nice. And um, it is, I uh, I didn't start off in a facilitator role, but I got asked to be a co-facilitator pretty early on. And then I, uh, the person who founded that group uh, went back to work full time and, and couldn't maintain the responsibilities anymore. And I just I took over the group from there in terms of the facilitating roles. Nice. And um, so I've been doing that since about 2018. Nice. Yeah, it sounds like you because of your own personal experience, obviously, with the devastation of losing your son that your heart was first of all broken but then sent in a certain journey uh, not only the yeah. answers but it looks like god's used you to definitely impact other people and to kind of raise awareness and um, uh, resources that kind of stuff so that's beautiful yeah and it's been part of the healing process for me as well um you know because uh, in the you know, everybody has a different grief journey mm-hmm. and, um, um, mine fairly early on, not, Im- not immediately, uh, but, uh, within the first uh, 30 days or so after my son died, um, I was very angry. You know, I went through this period of just being very angry and, um, I dove into, uh, writing and decided I would write a memoir and, and, uh, over the next year or so I, I, finished that up and published the memoir um, and really just, you know, vented a lot of my frustrations in that book. And uh, I look back on it now and I, and, you know, I can glance over the book and I, I just cringe when I read certain parts <laughs> because, because my views have changed a lot. Uh, my views about addiction and, and um, uh, you know, I, I just really was, I think I was really judgmental of people who were struggling with addiction issues because I didn't understand. Um, and so, uh, but for whatever reason, that book has struck a chord with a lot of people. Um, it's free for people to download the Kindle version uh, or the digital version. And um, 
man, it's had a ton of downloads and I've had people reach out to me. Um, right. Some people who are, you know, recovered addicts, um, just, just people from all walks of life, you know, parents who've lost a child to addiction, different situations, but uh, it's really com- connected me to a lot of people. Well, it sounds like it's, even though it may, you may have changed your views, you've deepened mm-hmm. your understanding. It resonates with people because that's possibly what they're feeling. Like they, they resonate with the story because of their own experiences. Yeah. I think, I think particularly people who are in recovery, they go, wow, this is what my family, this is what I was putting my family through, right. you know? And, and I didn't realize because I don't think they've ever the fact that it was so raw and that it was right on the heels of his death, I think yeah. gives them a clearer perspective of what a family member is feeling like when they're going through that. Yeah, because it's gonna, from them, it's going to look very different. It's going to be an experience very different. They feel judgment and anger and almost hatred from their family mm. when really that's grief and sorrow and confusion and lack of understanding and education has happened. Yeah, that too. And, you know, that's what you brought up there about the grief is really an important point. And I talk about that quite often that um, really um, there is what uh, some people call anticipatory grief. Uh, Mm -hmm. When, when a parent is, is, um, uh, you know, experiencing a situation where they have a child with a, a, when I say child, you know, it's usually, any that age. means uh, teenagers or or adult children, um, but uh, when, when they're experiencing that um, situation, they're grieving um, because they're uh, number one. They feel like they've lost the child that they have because they're no longer behaving like that child. Right. Um, and then this, the other thing is they're they're scared to death of what could happen, whether it's an overdose or some other drug related incident that takes their life, and so. Um, they're already in the grieving process. Right. And uh, I'll tell people that it really it's that part of the grieving process is is more intense in some respects than than the grief that comes after losing a child. Mm-hmm. So, very true. Because you you just don't know what's coming. You're always in anticipation of what, you know, what's going to come that you're dreading. Yeah. And you're losing the the dream, like we have a picture of what we want to see our mm. kids grow up and family and that they're healthy. And so all that is dying slowly, a slow, slow painful yeah. death, if you will. Um, but yeah, that anticipation of the unknown of what's the next phone call going to be with what kind of yeah. drama is almost, it is more stress on the body, the mind, relationships, your marriage, all that stuff. Oh yeah, that that is so true. Um, you know, when you get that phone call late at night and you're thinking, uh, is that the police and what do they want? You know, yeah. um, and there's nothing good, whatever, you know, I mean, um, or you know, you're getting a phone call and you don't know who is calling and and you're wondering, you know, it just, you know, you kind of get triggered. Yeah. Um, and and parents have to work on that to try to control those those fears, you know. So for you, the journey, you wrote that memoir, which was very raw. And then you said your views had changed. A lot of the, a lot of that came from your research, right? From your being a student, basically. Yeah. A student in a lot of different ways. And um, part of it was, um, you know, I sort of, um, I became acquainted with kids who were in Chase, in the circle that Chase was running in. Okay. And uh, I got pretty involved with them. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't recommend anybody else do that. (laughs) 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 But it was my way of learning. And Mm -hmm. uh, um, I learned some things that way for sure. And I learned some things to steer clear of, you know. Yeah. But, um, uh, and I I tried to help, you know, I I, I helped one kid get into treatment. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, in the meantime, his life was such a, such a mess. You know, I was trying to help him and, and trying to help him get all of everything together he needed to. And he actually moved in with us for a little while. Mm. And that's the part I wouldn't recommend um, for a lot of different reasons. But, uh, but I did learn a lot by, you know, interacting with him. Nice. Well, I know a lot of the things that I see is 
the confusion about what does it mean to love them? Mm. Like you even mentioned, you know, having that kid move in with you. It's so hard to know what the actual, my next step here, is it me loving them or am I actually only making it worse? Because mm. our heart is to mm. rescue. Our heart is to save. Yeah. And yeah. we're not the savior. That's but yet right. you want to. Every fiber of your being wants to. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, you know, how do you help people? Mm-hmm. How do you help people in that situation? And, uh, you know, it takes me back to when I was a kid. My, my dad was a Southern Baptist preacher. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, um, that you know, he was always, he had a very kind heart. He was always looking for ways to, it wasn't necessarily looking for ways to help people, but when he saw people in need, you know, he would um, would try to help. And he, um, he, you know, he had that wisdom to know that, um, when someone came to him for help, um, uh, in, you know, looking for money or whatever, like, you know, you don't give them money. Like I'll buy you some gas or I'll, I'll go buy you a meal if you want a meal. But even that can be sometimes not such a good idea because it frees up money for them to go spend on drugs. Yeah. You know, so it's like, how do you help someone that's in that situation? Um, you know, and, and the best thing that you can do, I think, is to, you know, make resources available to them. Like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make treatment available or I'll point you in the right direction, you know, to where you can get the help that you need. Well, I think the scary thing about addiction in general is you, no matter what we do, no matter our heart, no matter even the effort or even money, mm. it's hard to help someone who doesn't want help that's their yeah, best friend. That's now. right. Yeah. The, the drug yeah. of choice is their best friend. And you're basically that's, telling them to betray their best friend. Yeah. And that, that is a really good point because um uh you know first of all they have to want the help and and but then you have to be careful. Uh you really have to have some discernment there right. because they can be very, very manipulative <sighs> and, and it is not it's not that they're intending to be they're not they're not intending to take advantage of you well you know sometimes they might be but in a right. lot of cases it's just that craving for their substance mm-hmm. is so strong that their subconscious mind is driving them to do things and say things you know um and and they do end up taking advantage of you if right. you're not careful so you really have to be discerning about about those sort of things. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where like with addiction, if you think of our free will, and then let's say that we had, and I don't think this is necessarily true, but 100% of our free will, when you get impaired, so when there's something else that is almost more in demand than anything else, my ability to choose shrinks. And so... Mm-hmm that becomes the most important thing. And so they, you will see someone who have, has incredible morals. It seemed like a few years ago, violate those morals and to the point of selling their body or other things they never would have done for that drug of choice. It's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. And usually um, uh, this is one thing that sort of changed my mind Mm -hmm. or made me begin to see things a little bit differently that, you know, people, who have an addiction, usually there's some sort of underlying uh, issue, a uh, psychological issue. Um, could be mental health. It could be, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell with mental health, with mental health, did the drugs cause the drug use cause the mental health problems or <laughs> were they there underlying to begin with, you know, which right. came first. Yeah. Um, and it can go either way, but um, uh, you know, um, uh, usually there's something they're trying to cope with. They're using the drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism. Yep. And um, it, so to me, it's very important to try to get them into therapy so that they can identify what is what are those underlying causes? What is really, what's at the root of all of that? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a, to me, that's a almost a minimal standard really for everyone. I don't think everyone needs to be in therapy but mm-hmm. we all have a mental health to stay, to handle or to manage. And it's mm-hmm. times of stress that actually makes that, you know, since play out, come out, which freshman year of college um, can definitely do it. Or even wrapping up high school, if there's a high demand for either achievement or grades or 
sports mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. a lot of that. But there's the other side of that is for some, it's just pure. I, I tried it. I liked it. I want more of it. Mm-hmm. But for mm-hmm. a lot of people, I think you're right. It's There is something else underlying the majority um, that there's a reason why they're trying to cover pain you know, or mm-hmm. pursue pleasure. But Yeah. Um, man, there's so many different variables involved with, with addiction, you know, uh, there, there, I think sometimes there is a, um, uh, genetic, uh, predisposition Absolutely, you know, for yes. some people. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed that, you know, when I add, when I, when I meet parents who, um, the only parents come to me with this issue, one of the first questions I will ask is, has your child ever been diagnosed ADD, ADHD? Yep. And it seems like nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. Yep. So it, true. it seems like more so with boys. Correct. But uh, so there's there's definitely a correlation there. And I'm not 100% sure on what it is. I don't think anybody really knows 100%. I think, you know, sometimes um, it could be, um, you know, they it could be the drugs that they were prescribed uh, could have mm-hmm. a bearing on it. Uh, sometimes they're very, uh, ADHD people can be very, um, impulsive. Mm-hmm. So that impulsivity tends to lead towards, you know, trying things that other people wouldn't try, you know, things right. like that. Very, very true. Yeah. So with like, with your son, did he end up during that season, go to going to treatment at all or. He what? did go to treatment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, you know, he dropped out of college and mm-hmm. came back home and gravitated to a really rough crowd here at home. Yeah. And um, uh, at one point he had moved out. Uh, he and I sort of butted heads a little bit. And mm-hmm. and really, I just, I just, I just, um, it, my wife and I both had agreed that there were certain guidelines, like you, you can't be gone overnight or for two or three days and not communicate with us if you're staying at home. And right. he wasn't trying to, he was he wouldn't abide by those rules and he wasn't trying to better himself. Um, I'd offered to, you know, help him get into community college to, to, to learn a trade, or mm-hmm. I suggested maybe the military, but he wasn't interested in really doing any of that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. he, um, so, you know, at one point he came home and he'd been gone for like three days without any communications and I wouldn't let him in. And so um, I kept up with him on social media. He lost weight rapidly. He wasn't a real big kid to begin with now. He's rail thin, pale, glassy eyed. I'm, I'm watching his, his pictures that he's posted on social media. And so we decided to have, um, really, I decided. <laughs> My wife went along with me and she didn't argue, but but uh, I decided that an intervention would be a good idea. And uh, okay. really out of all the things I did, I think, the intervention was one of the better ideas. Nice. Um, and, and we were able to get him into treatment through that intervention. It was, it was a tense. It's, I, I would tell any parent that's thinking about doing it, it is a very difficult thing to go through, yeah. but I think the, in most cases, I, I don't know what the success rate is, but it seems like they're very good at, you know, good interventionists. who have been at this for a while are very good right. about getting them to agree to go to treatment. Um, so he was in treatment 30 days, um, and then, uh, in South Florida. Okay. And, uh, that's another whole story. There was a, <laughs> there were a lot going on with, with treatment facilities in South Florida at that time. But, um, uh, he went from there into a halfway house, bounced mm-hmm. around to several different ones. And he spent a total of about nine months in Florida. Um, okay. he came back home and he was doing a lot better. He was staying away from the people who had been a bad influence before, he was, uh, he got a job. Nice. Um, it was a starter job. He was working retail, you know, not mm-hmm. making a lot of money, but he was trying, you know, yeah. and uh, he was going to IOP intensive outpatient care, like group therapy two nights a week. Okay. Um, he seemed to want to get better and, um, uh, things were rolling along in a good direction, but as time went by, you know, he was beginning to relapse and I could sense that still mm-hmm. didn't really know a lot about addiction. And, right. um, and really, I hadn't dived in at that point. Um, I just saw it at that point as, you know, I, it wasn't anything, it wasn't my problem. He had a problem. And right. and and I think a lot of parents have this um, this kind of false idea that, oh, my, my kid has a substance abuse problem. I'm going to send him to treatment and they'll fix him. You know, they'll cure him and send him back. And he'll be, you know, good as new. And that's not how it works. Nope. 
And I think I knew better than that intellectually, but in my mind, somewhere in the back of my mind, I, I know I was sort of thinking that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, really, I didn't realize I needed to work on myself during that time and and learn more about addiction and, and improve my communication skills and my parenting yeah. skills and all of that. Um, so that that's one of my things I would say to parents out there that are listening, you know, but um, he um, he began to relapse and he came to me one day and he said, dad, you know, I'm headed in a bad direction again. And I said, I know <laughs> I could sense it. And he said, I'm, I'm hanging around a rough crowd and I know I need to get away from these people who are a bad influence, but I just don't know how to accept a move. So he told me he had taken a job transfer back to Florida okay. um, to the area where he had been in treatment. And uh, um, I told my wife, Kim, she made Chase promise he would come by and have a meal with us before leaving. Well, the day that he was supposed to come by and eat with us, he didn't show up. And it's getting later in the afternoon. Kim's getting up. She's getting upset because she thinks he's left for Florida without stopping by to say goodbye. And we all moved to the living room. We're sitting around in the living room, uh, just kind of talking, watching a little TV. And uh, I had a phone call from one of my friends. Well, I didn't want to disturb Kim and Justin with my phone conversation. Justin is our younger son. Okay. He was in the eighth grade at the time. Ooh. So I went outside. And I'm on my phone outside talking to my friend. It was May the 29th, 2014, really nice weather out. And I'm standing there in the front lawn talking to my friend on the cell phone when the police cruiser pulled up to the curb in front of my house. And the uh, officer got out of his car and started up my driveway. And I told my friend, got to go. Apparently Chase is in some kind of trouble. And I went to meet that officer. And uh, there in the driveway is where he told me that um, that Chase, there'd been a bad wreck and that Chase had died. And... Um, Wow. He accompanied me inside and I broke the news to my wife and, uh, and to Justin. And of course we all cried for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, it took us a while to get settled down. And, and then we started asking the officer questions about what had happened. Wow. Can't imagine. Yeah. And that definitely, I mean, that's going to send you into a search and, and then, mm-hmm. you know, for our listeners today, well, part of what you do now and the the heart behind your life right now is um, the family recovery coach.com as in moms, dads, siblings, grandparents listening. If you need help um, you're you've dedicated your, your life now to doing that. So uh, the family recovery coach.com. Um, to yeah. And families. I would be really quick to point out uh, to people that I'm not a licensed counselor or therapist. That's not not what I do. I'm I'm a family recovery coach. So I'm a person who has walked in your shoes. If you have a um, child who has a a substance abuse or substance use disorder, um, uh, I've walked in your shoes. I know what it's like. And uh, I can help them with navigating the, you know, treatment options early on with trying to decide, make some really tough decisions about how to handle the situation. You know, do, you know, is, do they need an intervention? Right. You know, those sorts of things. Um, And then, you know, working on communications, communication skills um, and, and learning about addiction, if they're, if we can get their child into treatment while they're in treatment, that's a perfect time to uh, work on um, all of that, you know, yeah. the communication skills and, and learning about addiction and, and then working on setting healthy boundaries. Mm-hmm. And that's where thinking back to that season from your son dropping out of college and then getting eventually into recovery, you know, in the intervention, that whole mm-hmm. season, the part lacking was what you're basically trying to fill that void for families is Mm -hmm. you that's exactly you didn't realize what you didn't know and needed to know and need to learn so you've dedicated now your life to to families and yeah family piece is so critical family systems theory the idea of a system that actually when Mm -hmm. one thing changes the whole system has to be changed so we send our kid away to get help they come back if the system hasn't grown then we actually tend to mm. force that kid back into the old role. And so that's right. That's you're, exactly you're, right. Your growing is critical. Yeah. So, I mean, how did this, um, how did this, I guess, how did you guys as a couple navigate this? Cause you have two separate people, two very different people, I'm assuming. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> did not handle all the way from when you found things out when he was in college 
Mm. Like I bet there's a lot of places in there where you didn't either agree or you wrestled or struggled. What was some of the tips you have when it comes to that for your marriage? Yeah. <laughs> well, I I would just say this um, um, for the guys out there listening, uh, get uh, marry a really good wife like I did <laughs> <laughs> because she, <laughs> she yeah. put up with a lot of stuff. Well, I'll just say that, you know, she's, she's very, very uh, tolerant <laughs> of, of me. And um, so I would just say that she gave me a lot of grace in that area for sure. Um, she, she is, um, we were, we are very different, you know, in that mm-hmm. respect. And, and actually I think I was probably, and, and it's not usually like this. I think, I think in most families, the dad is more, I was, I was definitely have the military background. So I was definitely, um, very, uh, stern on, in mm-hmm. some regards and, and not as approachable as she was, but in some ways I was the. I was the bigger enabler. I was the bigger okay. rescuer, you know, okay. and, and I was the one who was out there, you know, uh, trying to figure out what he was up to and trying and, you know, kind of meddling in his affairs a little bit, trying yeah. to, trying to rescue him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, and in terms of the grief, um, you know, early on, I just didn't, you know, I didn't have a clue yeah. Um, she went to grief share. I don't know if you, if you're familiar yes. with grief share or not, but yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Really good program. And, and I was doing my own grieving and mine was through, through my book, you know, through writing the book and, and really I should have gone to grief share with her mm-hmm. and, and I didn't, you know, and, and, uh, but she was very tolerant of that. She went twice on her own and, um, she got me into, um, kind of the end of the last um, uh, time that she went through. And then eventually I went on my own okay. uh, to, <laughs> to a share program. Yeah. Uh, and I would recommend that to anyone who's, who's going through that. Which uh, that's a good of- point is that you're going to both grieve in different ways. So you mm-hmm. did it with writing, um, but then she went to a very good program and there are, there are these all over the country Um, And if there's not one near you, find a church and ask them to do it. And like, it's a really good program, but your spouse may not want to join you. They may refuse to. Right. That grace is really critical for the timing of when they hopefully will. And, you know, here's the one other thing I would like to point out on that is that um, she shared with me later how hard she was grieving and she did not really share that at the time Hmm. and i think that's pretty common with women that they you know don't always tell you everything that they're thinking and right um you know she um maybe that's a little bit different with her though in in the in the respect that um she she was very just keeping that to herself because she said she, yeah, well, she, 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 she said, well, I I knew you were going through your own grieving process and I didn't want to interfere with that. So she didn't share with me, but I, I, you know, at the time I, you know, if I, if I could go back and do it again, I would say, Hey, you know, I wish you had told me because um, I didn't realize just how serious it was, you know, for her. Well, I think that's uh, a really important support from me. Right. That's an important point. My wife would be that way as well. She's going to keep everything inside. But that mm-hmm. perspective of I don't want to add more to his plate. I don't want to burden him more. Right. One of the things that I do is called the healing marriage. And to me, this is the time you turn to each other even more so. This is a time mm-hmm. where we need to lean on each other. We must. But where I see it all fall apart is when I try to make them grieve like I grieve. Mm -hmm. there's not permission to grieve in your own way so it's like Mm -hmm. you either have to go to grief share or we're done and so i actually what i see is a lot of couples actually divorce during the season of loss um and no this is the time to hang on even tighter Mm -hmm. and to be honest Mm -hmm. about um don't go this alone Um, more women than men are going to go to counseling yeah men specifically men Find someone you can trust and whether it's a mentor or someone where you can word vomit or even break down, um, don't try to go this alone. 
Uh, and I know most of you probably will <laughs> for at least a season. Right. But finding right. that group, if the group isn't the right fit, find another one. Like grief shares are going to be all different no matter where you go or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Find one where you really, okay, this is going to be my team. Yeah, uh, it, it does seem like a lot of guys have a, have a difficult time sharing and being open, you know, in those types of environments. And uh, I would just say, you know, there were there was at least one other guy in my grief sharing. Might, I think there might have been two, but, um, uh, you know, uh, it was great for all of us, really. It, it was just a good, good program all the way around. And, um, man, you, you know, you have to get that stuff that's bottled up inside of you out. You have to get that pain out in healthy ways right? and keeping it bottled up inside, especially if you're going through that anger phase and not everybody goes through the same, all the same phases and, and, and in all the, in the same order. But especially if you're going through that anger, you, you've got to, you need a healthy outlet for that um, because just not, it's just not good for you. Right. Yeah, the one of the things that's also neat in terms of some of the research and just this kind of more also for the guys is some of you don't want to share and you don't have to, but mm -hmm. find a group with that's more educational and less hold hands and talk. <laughs> that's what it feels like to you. Probably. Right. Um, right. And you'll find that actually, and this is what's neat about some of the research is that sometimes the groups that are more educational actually can be more powerful than just a, just a group that's just sharing, sharing. That's why grief share has got both. And it's got the teaching along with a time to actually, in a sense, be in fellowship with others that are grieving. But that teaching time is the part we want to push aside a lot. No, that's lean into that. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to say a word. You don't have to share anything until you're ready. And so lean into that teaching you know, you, you brought another idea to mind uh, for those guys that are, that are out there listening mm -hmm. and are going through the grieving process. Um, you know, I think the 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 teaching side of that is important. Mm -hmm. However, if they're not ready for a program like what you and I are describing here with Grief Share, mm -hmm. um, one thing that I have found for guys, um, when guys need to discuss um, deep, uh, difficult topics, um, one of the best things to do is to go do something with a with a dad or brother or another Amen. guy friend that doesn't involve that that involves using your hands to do something. Like uh, my dad and I used to go fishing all the time. We had some of the best conversations while exactly. we were fishing. You know. Yeah. Um, and you don't even have to make eye contact, you know, sometimes you don't even have to say a whole lot, you know, right. it's just, just being there together is, uh, is really, um, a, a great experience. And, and a lot of times there's a lot of nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of the, the power of community, but for men, you, you look at churches and look at women's ministries and women's group, it tends to be large. It tends to be fellowship and full of activity mm -hmm. and the men's mm -hmm. is over here either dead or dying mm -hmm. because it needs to center around some shared activity. Yep. Anywhere from mountain climbing to go shoot guns, to go ride motorcycles, to go to a UFC fight or whatever it is. And everyone's got their different thing, but I'm a shrink. I'm a counselor. So for me, eye contact is critical and I've had to yep. learn yep. sitting around a fire where you can't really make eye contact some of the mm -hmm. most amazing conversations can be had yeah um or sitting at a basketball game next to someone where you're looking forward but you're talking to each other they're going to open up more yeah. find those find your tribe find your people and find it around your area that you love i'm a motorcycle guy i ride a harley it's been you know in my years past um my previous life in georgia it was my motorcycle guys that were kind of my tribe. Now it's Boy Scout mm -hmm. dads, uh, but men, you okay. need yeah. you need that. So I love that you made that point. That's a, such an important point of just shared activity, and you sometimes don't even have to share much. Yeah, you know my younger son um, Justin. He's uh, he's a recent college graduate, and mm -hmm. uh, 
he is uh, waiting to uh, uh, enroll in a PhD program this fall. Nice. And uh, he's been home some and, and uh, he has a Microsoft flight simulator. Well, in my previous life, <laughs> I was a pilot. I was a professional pilot. Oh, neat. And so, yeah, so he knows that. And um, he's just suddenly taken an interest in uh, aviation. And so um, he's really absorbing a lot really fast. And uh, he'll call me in and I'm not, I've not been prompting this at all, but he'll call me in and say, Hey dad, come uh, handle the radios for me on this flight, you know? And uh, then he oh, asked me questions as we, as we do it together. And man, this has been a great, it's a great bonding uh, time, you know, activity for awesome. us. And, and yeah, we're both learning from each other. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, really how cool. Is, how old is he now? 22. 22. Yeah. So that's such yeah. a great, a lot of parents lose, potentially lose relationship as they graduate and leave. And so that's a great mm. thing to hang on to. Absolutely. Yeah. I know I love skiing and, and snowboarding and stuff. And so it's been fun to be on the lifts. And uh, this picture behind me is from just a few weeks ago up in um, the Cascades yeah, here in Oregon. Oh, neat. And just being able to just on the list, have conversations and I'm realizing, and they're going to leave and grow and be gone. And I'm going to lose my, my lift buddies. <laughs> right. <laughs> Each stage the of life requires. Happened. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was yeah. just going to say the same has happened to me with, yeah. um, you know, we, uh, we worked out together a lot. Uh, oh, nice. Both my boys played football and, uh, through college and, uh, um, you know, we, um, we work out a lot together. Nice. And so sometimes I miss him when he was gone. I don't have my workout partner. Here. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's come back to your marriage though. Like what, what yeah. were some of the struggles you guys had as a couple um, kind of just throughout those, those years? Um, did, was, was there something that happened? Was there, or you really work kind of got on the same page? Like how did that go for you guys? Previous to or during the during the addiction time or after the after he died or kind of whatever of that. stands out to you that, yeah. that can be helpful for those that might be really wrestling in their marriage because I that's what I see is a lot of couples their marriage is hanging on by a thread um, because pain yeah. brings out the worst part kind of of where we're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, you know, I have to go back a little bit because I'm I'm really good at blocking out some of those memories that, you know, aren't so yeah. good. It's aren't so good, but, yeah. um, um, I'm just thinking back on that a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, there was definitely a lot of it, a lot of tension when he was, um, in the midst of the, um, substance abuse. Um, and I think part of that was because I didn't understand what was going on mm -hmm. and, you know, I was just coming down on him, like, you know, what are you doing? And I was just really, you know, just, just trying to, trying to put, you know, get him in line. Right. And uh, yeah. I didn't realize that it's not that simple, you know, right. like, Hey, dad says, do this and you better straighten up and do this. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, you could, that's, I've got a little bit of military background. So that that's where some of that comes from. But, uh, uh, anyway, uh, you know, just that tension between the mm -hmm. two of us, between me and him. Um, and then, you know, with him, you know, being a teenager and the, the testosterone, both of us, you know, just button heads. I'm sure that happens a lot with, with fathers and sons out there, but I did not realize how much stress that was putting my wife under. I didn't realize how much it was stressing her out. And uh, she developed this um, situation with her legs where she would, um, she would, uh, it was noticeable at night and you would, you know, the first thing that pops into your head is restless leg syndrome. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, it was very similar to that in the, in the, um, the symptoms, but we went to every kind of doctor you can go to and wow. they, they ran every kind of brain scan you can think of. And, uh, we ended up going over to Duke University mm -hmm. and and doctor there, he looked at all of her charts. He looked at everything she'd been through and he was like, it's just stress, mm -hmm. just stress. Yep. The whole thing was just stress. 
And it was literally involuntary leg jerks to the, to the extent that, um, you know, she could be sitting uh, somewhere and we might be out somewhere and her right leg would just come way up and foot would slam down, you know? And um, anyway, I didn't realize how much, you know, my tension with, with our other son was stressing her out because again, that communication wasn't really there. So, um, you know, wives talk to your husbands and, yes. and, and, you know, I know that there are some that they definitely let their husbands know every time they're stressed out, maybe a little bit <laughs> yes. too much. Right. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but so it's, it's, it's personality driven. There are different personalities involved there, but, uh, but everybody's got, has to be, you know, communicating and, um, and, and this is, this kind of brings up another point to me for me here is, is back to the communications with the kids, but this applies really with all communications is that, you know, one of the things that, that they teach in PAL is respond, don't react. Mm-hmm. So there are things that tend to trigger all of us emotionally. Yep. And, and when we get triggered, we tend to lash out and say things that we don't mean or get really loud. And so when you feel that coming on, um, and I've had to learn how to do this, right. So part of the fruit of the spirit is (laughs) self-control. So (laughs) Oh, don't go there. Oh, don't go there. (laughs) Yes. So so I've had to learn self-control and and, and I'm still learning it, by the way, (laughs) I'm a work in progress. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when I feel that coming on, you know, I go, okay, wait, I feel this, I feel this coming on. I realize that I've been triggered emotionally and I need to just either step away for a few minutes or, you know, take a deep breath and get, get that heart rate down and get the breathing down. And then, you know, when I'm under control, then we can have a, a response, not a reaction. And oh, true. it makes a huge difference in the communication because when you have that reaction, the, the wall just goes up right away, you know, yeah. and the communication stop. You may be talking back and forth, but there's no communication really <laughs> taking place. What it reminds me of um, Gary Smalley a um, long time ago in his seventies before he passed away, he made the comment and and probably one of his last books he wrote and last times he was speaking, but he's like, I finally figured out how to love my wife. It's like, Ooh, mm-hmm. Gary Smalley. Let's, let's find out. What is this? He said, it's not tailgating. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, I'm fine with it. But when I get closer to that car in front of me, my wife's stress level goes up. And my That's loving her. One is not doing things that cause her more stress and it's like oh crap yeah, <laughs> it's true it's yeah well because i hear from people with me yeah, yeah. Well, i hear people all the time it's like well this is just the way i am it's like yeah and that's probably an area that needs some work <laughs> right <laughs> just i'm angry or i i don't i, I just react so learn skills uh-huh. to put a pause button in there so you don't react so that you can respond mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I tell people it's a practice, it is. um, just like, um, there's a medical practice and yep. a law practice <laughs> <laughs> because they're still learning. Right. Yep. And, uh, you know, you never stop learning. Uh, hopefully well, like, that's the goal. Like you in the medical, learning and I can't imagine how much money you probably spent on asking doctors the question of what's wrong with her legs to then find out mm. the stress. I've heard that so many right. times. Mm-hmm. My whole health mm-hmm. journey is, it's been crazy. And hospitalizations galore and medications, like so many things. And now I'm, I manage it with just diet and stress management. So no, Mm -hmm. I don't spend money on all those people. It's like our stress is actually, we're all different and some can handle a lot Mm -hmm. more. Um, And then Mm -hmm. we see through like military service in certain places there or severe trauma where you have PTSD, kind of the extreme reaction um, and it can be from anything, but losing a child or having a child, even if you haven't lost them, um, as you even kind of pointed out, it's almost harder even the season when they're still going through where there's always the unknown, wondering if the next phone call, uh, what's the next shoe that's going to drop, that stress, mm-hmm. your wife was responding and her body was actually communicating very loudly I'm not okay. I'm not, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. 
Yeah. And, and we weren't, you know, nobody had a clue. Oh. Not even she re realized what was causing all of that. And I think about that a lot. Like a lot of people, their body's even telling them stuff. But because we mm -hmm. don't understand that language, we don't hear mm -hmm. it. We don't know. And a lot of our mental health and physical health, physical health symptoms, I think, are more stress-related and life-related than some diagnosable, here's a pill for that, uh, which is really what we want. We want some quick fix. Mm -hmm. Because you're in a season um, that's hard, that's actually not hard. It's near impossible for us as humans. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the um, the PTSD, I, mm -hmm. I firmly believe that some of the parents that I have uh, worked with um, have experienced PTSD. Absolutely, yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just I used to really not think PTSD was real. But I do believe it's real now. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I, I do believe that some of these parents are experiencing PTSD um, because. Well, the, uh, go well ahead. that word PTSD or that those letters, we tend to only associate it with military. Right. Even though there's yeah. been a, a couple of decades of research showing con the contrary. We still tend to associate that. So, yes, absolutely. Mm. The, the trauma that we get sent through and stress from um, a child and, and someone we love and their their drama, if you will, um, their relationship with their addiction, and then the loss, absolutely yes. Some of these parents, their children have overdosed multiple times or oh. been, been to treatment and back multiple times or overdosed in front of them or they had to revive them. These are some of the situations, you know, that's a very traumatic experience having to basically bring your own child back to life, you know, or yeah. save their life. Absolutely. Yeah. So fast forward to today, 2023, it's been many, many years. Uh, I guess that's nine years. Um, how are you, I know what you're doing is, you know, the family recovery coach.com and how are things for you, your marriage? Um, what's changed since then for you guys? Uh, let's see. Well, I think, you know, um, I would say that we're closer probably now than we've ever been. Um, Great. uh, yeah. Um, in some respects, you know, in some respect, there, there's definitely room for improvement, you know, yeah, but of course, but there's, <laughs> forever, there, there's no, of uh, heaven. <laughs> there's no, um, there's no storm clouds on the horizon. There's no, there's no emergencies or anything, right. You know, they're really pressing and, um, uh, you know, probably I don't still, you know, being the guy, I probably still don't pay as much attention to certain things as I should. <laughs> and, and I know that at least I'm aware of that. You know, I, I get into my, um, into my zone in terms mm -hmm. of trying to get my work done and things like that. And, and, uh, but I try to be, um, uh, cognizant of, you know, I know that she wants a certain amount of, and she's not very demanding on time. Like a lot of women, you know, are, but she, <laughs> She is, and I'm very fortunate in that regard that she, you know, she gives me my space. She gives me my time, but, but I know I need to spend, you know, X amount of time with her every day and we're going to carve out this time. And and we do try to go do things together. And nice. um, we are right now, we're, uh, we finally uh, bought a, a lot. <laughs> she retired in uh, 2020, February, 2020. And we started looking for it. We've been in our starter house for, over 30 years. <laughs> and, uh, we, uh, we were ready for, we we're ready to move out a little bit and, and have a little bit bigger home and nothing huge, but just a little bit bigger and something newer. And, um, and, um, you know, it was just the worst time in the world to start looking for a new house. And, uh, <laughs> finally she decided I found the perfect floor plan and, uh, this is what I want. And let's just build this house and you pick the lot. You know, and so uh, we, at first she wanted a like a waterfront property, but that was getting harder and harder to find uh, yeah. during the COVID times because a lot of people moving to this area. Right. 
And so um, we found a seven and a half acre lot in the country. And um, I grew up in the country. So it allows us to at least have some serene surroundings, some really beautiful surroundings with a lot of wildlife and all that. So the build hasn't started yet, but we're hoping to get it done by the end of this year. Nice. And uh, so that's, that's something that we're working on together that we're both, there's a future vision there, you know, and um uh, one of the things that did bring us together a lot too, and we're kind of come to the end of an era with that now is our, you know, both of our boys played football from the time they were just little kids. And um, uh, so when, when our youngest one, Justin was playing football in college, we would, it was a four hour drive from here, but every home game and, and most away games, we would be there to uh, watch his, his football games and cheer him on and, that was just a, a great bonding time, you know, the, the drive there yeah. and back, you know, when, when I wasn't tailgating, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like you brought up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I'm guilty of that. I don't really, I don't think I tailgate, but she does. So, Same you know, here. if she thinks I tailgate, <laughs> then it's a problem, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. So point taken on that. Uh, I'll, I'll be working on that. But, but yeah. <laughs> those are those are kind of some of the things that we share together that you know uh give us that that mm -hmm. time together to really you know work on our relationship that's neat yeah and that's the the you mentioned kind of before we hit record that she's retired and you're retired but you're really not retired as in right what you're doing now is the family recovery coach and your heart and passion is to serve families and the cool thing is, is we can do it in a way through zoom and through other means um, but one of the things that I even encourage other people just thinking about is if you're not involved in a local church, find a local church, get involved with mm -hmm. real people face to face, uh, for your own sanity. But yes, there are online, yeah. incredible online communities that will support you, love you, um, be there for you. And then partner with someone who actually has been on that journey, um, and can help support you through that uh, season. It's really, really, really a lifesaver. That's a great point that you bring up there. And um, I would just say that, you know, um, the the group that I volunteer my time with is PAL, Parents of Addicted Loved Ones. It is a Christian-based group. And um, they are nationwide, nonprofit, mm -hmm. Um most, uh, if you, you go on their website, you can find a, they, they, they prefer that, you have in-person meetings and really I do too. But when yes. COVID hit, my group mm -hmm. moved online right. and we haven't been back. Um, but uh, so we do have an online meeting and, and PAL does have um, their headquarters online meeting that people can get into. So if they can't access a local meeting, they can get into an online meeting yeah. if they need to. But that community with other parents who are going through the same thing is so, so, so vital. And that's where I 100% agree. In person, face to face, incarnational in the body changes mm -hmm. our our physiology. We are meant to be in person. Yeah. It's how we are made. We found that out through COVID, but it's also what we learned is that the power of just anybody when I have nobody, the online becomes a lifesaver, a lifeline that I I those will continue. Those were not going to that's not going to fade yeah. away. Also, That's what right. I've seen is um, the role of that for people who are busy, who can't make the drive, who have little kids at home and can't deal with, you know, sitters and all that. The online allows for you to walk in the garage, <laughs> pull up your laptop. Right. Um, I, I meet with people all the time that I'm like, oh, you're in your other office and they're sitting in their car in the mm -hmm. garage. <laughs> Don't turn the car uh -huh, on. Uh -huh. But right. they and they would you know, are able to to be a part of a community, but not just be to receive. You're a part of that community to also give. Yes. You may not think you have anything to give, but that is not true. That you actually, yeah, that the worst of true. your pain, someone mm -hmm. will be blessed by hearing your story, hearing your mm -hmm. heart. So be a part of this community online or in person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the one other thing I would like to mention is that uh, I am still available for uh, prevention speaking. I've done quite a bit of that um, you could. in terms of, um, you know, impaired driving prevention and just uh, drug prevention. 
Um, you know, Chase's story is a really, really, really crazy story with a lot of twists and turns. And um, I've been telling it for so long, you know, I can I can tailor it to any group, but the the core story obviously remains the same. But mm -hmm. um, uh, I've, I've really talked to a lot of um, high school and um, middle school age uh, kids and even college age. And um, it it uh, really I see a lot of kids wiping away tears when they hear the story because it it does it definitely touches them and I get a lot of a lot of people come up to me after the after the talk and want to engage so um, so anybody that that's looking for you know prevention speaking um, you know churches that's really uh, my second talk was in a church. Nice. And yeah, um, so your your yeah. website, thefamilyrecoverycoach.com. There's a phone number that's up top, yeah. blog, contact information. Definitely reach out to book a speaking. Um, but also if you, and I can't stress this enough, if you need someone to help walk you through, find a coach, find someone who, mm -hmm. the word that I, I use instead of even coaching is it's discipleship. Mm, it's helping you... Yeah through a season of becoming someone bigger and better than you are, but it actually matters who you're being led by. So if you're being led by someone who's not well at all, or has a very different worldview than you, you're going to become more like your teacher. So careful. So find yeah. someone who's a believer who um, can walk you through and point you to scripture and point you to a community. Um, it, it, that's critical. So reaching out to, um, Daryl Rogers, but another, uh, you have more web, like I do, I have tons of websites, but your other <laughs> place you can go is darylrogers.com, D A R R Y L R O D G E R S.com. Um, link will be in the show notes too, but, um, go there. There's actually a, a course that you have and free downloads for some PDFs, just some tools to help you. Um, if you're in this season, if this is something that you're facing right now, uh, do not do this alone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can't stress that part enough. Yeah, definitely, definitely need to, to find somebody to, mm -hmm. to, um, help them through that. Wonderful. And so Daryl, thank you so much for being on the show and talking and, and sharing with our audience and, um, definitely been a blessing to me. I teach a the psych of addiction class here at the university I teach at, and we'll be talking about what we've talked about and, and um, have, I'll have them listen to what you're, you even said, just okay. to, okay. they prepare to be um, helpers, but um, just a, a definite blessing to have you on and your vulnerability. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on today. Pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to the Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert podcast. It has been an honor to serve. If you are struggling, have questions, or in need, Dr. Gilbert offers a free consultation for new clients. Check us out at HealingLives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages transformed, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Healing Lives Center offers online courses, programs, books, intensives, and other services to help you live biblically and well. Discover more resources on YouTube and in Dr. Gilbert's Healing Marriage Facebook group, The Healing Marriage.